Well, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15. Today we are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And so for the rest of 2022, we'll be preaching and teaching from the Gospel of Luke. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you today, there's a Bible under the seat in front of you. If you reach out and grab that Bible, you can use that uh, tonight during the message, and you'll find Luke chapter 15 on page 1039. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily at your house, we invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. Take Calvary Baptist Church stamp name off, write your name in there, make it your own Bible, and the only the only caveat to that is that is that we ask that you read God's word and apply it to your life. We are firm believers that if we want change, if we want to experience a relationship with God, that if we read and apply his word, he will transform us. Uh, today we're looking at the passage of scripture that many people have heard about, whether you grew up in the church or not. It's a passage of scripture that many people in our, uh, the culture of America is familiar with. It's the story it, that Jesus tells in Luke 15 about the man who had a hundred sheep and one of them went astray and he went out to search for that. Now, I don't know about you as a child, but I know that I grew up living in the woods in Middle Tennessee. I did not have a cell phone with GPS that could tell me how to find my way back home. But as a child, I would go out into the woods and we would play half the day in the woods. And sometimes we would get turned around. Sometimes we wouldn't know exactly where we were. And we would just wander around until we saw something familiar and we would make our way home. Uh, back in 1984, my family was camping out over one summer at a, 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 a state park in Tennessee. And one day I was out there. We were swimming in the lake all day long. It got dark. I didn't go when I should have with my brothers and sisters. And so as it's getting dark, I get out of the lake and I'm looking around and nothing looked familiar. There were camper lights and there were campfires and there were lanterns and there were flashlights. And I was not used to seeing the park from where I was that late at night in the dark. Nothing made sense to me. And so I start to panic a little bit and I'm wandering around. I'm going to campsite to campsite trying to find my way back home. And I start to sniffle a little bit because I'm worried that my parents packed up and left without me. You know, I'm getting, nobody even knows I'm gone. No one cares. There's no search parties out, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm worried that I'm never going to make my way back to the campsite. Then finally, a, a park ranger or a person that worked at the park saw me crying, took me and said, okay, where, what's your name? Found where I was supposed to be. And that was that. Now, I knew I was in the campground. I knew I was near the lake. I knew I was along a road, but I had no clue how to get back to my family. Now, I want to ask you if you would help me out by, by a show of hands. Raise your hand if you have ever been lost before in your life. Thank you. Raise your hand if you were lost when you were a child and you know that feeling of anxiety and fear. Okay, now raise your hand if you would like for one of your family to get lost for a little bit. <laughs> you know, whether it's, whether it's driving in, in unfamiliar territory, whether it's in a grocery store as a child and, and your mom abandons you or you're, you abandon your parents and you're gone, that feeling of being lost is a very heavy feeling when you know you're not where you are to be. When you, as a child, you're looking for reassurance from your parents' faces, that's where you get that sense of confidence that you're doing something right. And when you're lost, you're not able to see your parents' face and you're having to make decisions all on your own. 
What I want you to do is I, I want you to remember that feeling of being lost as we look at this passage of scripture and we see how God interacts with mankind. So let's read together page 1039. Now I will be reading from the New Living Translation today. So if you follow along in one of our Bibles among you, one of our Bibles that are under the seats, you may not be able to follow along word for word. That's okay. Luke 15, one through seven. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Now, it's important that as we read this passage, we all understand why Jesus told this story. Jesus wasn't just telling the story to make people feel good or find something amazing about God in this passage. Look at verses one through three. The reason why Jesus told this story is because the religious leaders were complaining about the type of people that were coming to hear Jesus speak. The religious leaders were complaining about the, the sinful people that were coming around to hear Jesus. I mean, the word notorious sinners suggests to us, or that phrase suggests to us that these people were flamboyant with their sin. Uh, that these people that they were talking about, they were cheaters, they were liars, uh, they were prostitutes, they were sexually immoral, and those were the type of people that were coming to hear Jesus speak. So the religious leaders, they get upset and they start complaining to Jesus about the type of people that are there. Now, I know that that most of us would never complain about any type of person that, that comes to our worship gathering to hear God's word. But I will tell you that in American culture, that's not always the case. Uh, unfortunately, it's often the case that people who are considered to be notorious sinners feel unwelcomed inside the church. They, they feel judged when they come inside the church. So maybe you can relate to that sense a little bit. Maybe that was you in your younger days. Maybe you felt like you were judged and you were put down and, and you were looked down upon because you walked into a church building to hear God's word being taught. See, that, that breaks the heart of God that people who claim to know God personally that people who claim to be examples of what people should look like would cast other people out. See, the Pharisees chose to complain and focus on the faults of the people around them. And that's because religious people focus on faults, not forgiveness. Religious people focus on faults, not forgiveness. See, the Pharisees at this time, they really believed that they had cornered the market on what it was that God wanted from people. They really believed that the way they acted, what they did, what they thought, how they treated other people, the Pharisees and religious leaders believed that they were right. 
that, that God was really pointing to the Pharisees and religious leaders as examples of how everybody else should be. And that if the more people were just like them, then the Jewish world would be a far better place. And they had a phrase that they would slap on to these notorious sinners. It, it wasn't just the people that were gathered in this passage, but the Jewish people had a phrase that it was a derogatory phrase that they used as a classification for people who did not attempt to follow Jewish law. The phrase that they used was the people of the land. They would call Jewish people who would not listen to the Old Testament law or Jewish people who would not be, live like they did, they would call them in a derogatory way, the people of the land. They were earthly people. They were people who had no spiritual thoughts. They were low, they were ungodly. They were people of the land. In fact, if you were categorized as a person of the land and you saw a crime that happened, your eyewitness testimony was no good because you were a person of the land. They wouldn't give you any money to hold for them. Uh, they would not trust you with a secret. They would not even travel with you along the road or allow you to be a foster parent or care for an orphan because you were considered a people or person of the land. The Pharisees did everything they could to not be associated with people of the land. That's why they were so bothered by Jesus who always spent time with notorious sinners. Uh, they went out of their way to not be around people like them. And here was this miracle worker, this person that was changing lives, who, who was talking about God and God's word and teaching. It seemed that the people of the land were flocking to him. And Jesus didn't mind at all. In fact, Jesus went to weddings and he went to parties and he had feasts with tax collectors. And that rubbed the religious leaders the wrong way. The people of the land were not like them. Now, in our world today, we, we have a variety of values that people have. We, we have different political views. We, we have different views now on COVID or monkeypox or student loans. We have different views on government and immigration. We have different views on families and different worldviews. We turn on the news and we hear people arguing and shouting at each other because their opinion matters more. We live in a world today that highlights the faults of other people, the faults that we have with one another, rather than living in a world that values and honors and lifts up forgiveness. If you're a follower of Jesus already, you understand how divisive the world is. You, under, you understand how divisive Christianity can be at times. And when we choose to focus on the faults of others rather than the forgiveness that Jesus offers, we become like the religious leaders when all we can do is zero in on the problems that we have with other people and not seek to walk in forgiveness and not seek to walk in faith, then we become just like the people who once turned you away from church. We become just like the people that Jesus was telling this story to. When the apostle Paul was writing to the followers of Jesus in the letter to the Colossians, he said in Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you and so you must also forgive others. See what God calls us to do as a follower of Jesus, so we're not chasing away people and we're not turning others out is to walk in a spirit of forgiveness. 
And I can tell you that is difficult because there are sometimes people who hurt us that we love, that we respect, that we admire, and it makes it truly difficult to walk in forgiveness, but the call to forgive remains unchanged. It doesn't matter if it's hard for us or not. God's word says to forgive and make allowance for one another's faults. And we have to remember the one simple truth that Jesus is teaching us here is that all people belong to God, but wander. All people belong to God, but wander. See, if you can remember that, you're going to be able to walk in a spirit of forgiveness a little bit more easily. Now, I'm not saying that all people are followers of Jesus. I'm not saying that all people have been forgiven for their sins and they've surrendered their lives. I'm saying all people do belong to God. That means the stubborn people that you know, the stubborn people you have a difficult time with, they belong to God. The people around you that live in fear and anxiety, they belong to God. The lonely people around you belong to God. The white ones, the black ones, the brown ones, the conservative ones, the liberal ones, they all belong to God. The people you agree with and the people you avoid. Every single person in this room, every seven billion people, all seven billion people on the planet, every person who has ever lived and every person who will ever live belongs to God. We are all his property. And so if we all belong to God, why on earth is this world such a mess? If we all belong to God, why is it that every day on the, in every territory, in every city, there's a child being abused. Why is it that some marriages end in divorce and bitterness? If we all belong to God, why is there cancer? If we all belong to God, why are there childhood diseases? Why is there sickness? Why is there death? Why do we struggle with loneliness and isolation and hurt feelings and pride and sadness? Why do we have division in politics? Why do we have division in churches? Why is there division inside families? If we all belong to God, why is the world messed up? Well, the answer is simple and it's found in this story. It's because we all belong to God, but we all wander. Even your sweet old granny who read her Bible every day, who prayed for you every day that you would give your life to Jesus, who served in her community and served in her church and prayed for you. Even your sweet old granny wandered from God. You can get at me later. I, I grew up about, uh, hearing, as a, as a Roman Catholic, I grew up uh, hearing stories about Mother Teresa and, and how she poured out her whole life feeding and taking care of the poor in India. And you know what she is? She's a sinner. That's what she is. I, I grew up hearing stories about the evangelist Billy Graham. He preached in over 185 countries. He preached to over 200 million people. And even though the world may want to lift him up as this incredible, godly man, Billy Graham is still a wanderer or was still a wanderer. Billy Graham was a sinner. Me, Joe Donahue, I preach sermon after sermon. I pray for people. I, I lead people G to Jesus. And you know what I am? A big fat sinner. My wife, she's perfect. <laughs> God used a word for what it looked like for sheep to wander. In Isaiah 53, 6, he actually called you and I sheep. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. See, every person that you've ever encountered has left God's path. 
Every person that's in this room has left God's path. What repentance is and what it means when you surrender your life to Jesus is you just get back on God's path. You just simply go back in the direction that he created you to go. I gave my life to Jesus in 1991. And as much as I would love to say from that point on, I never wandered from God's path. I would love to be able to say that, but that's not true. I have sinned since 1991. Don't play this video for my mom. I have sinned. I did not stop sinning when I gave my life to Jesus. I, I still struggle in my thought life. I still struggle with the things that uh, I say. I, I sometimes say the right thing in the wrong way. And I'm not going to go through a list of all my personal sin. But sometimes I struggle to not say the things I want to say. And I often fail to say the things that the Spirit is leading me to say. A couple of years ago, Christy and I were on our way back from Hawaii and we were flying back and we were on the plane and I was working on my sermon. So I reclined my seat back just a little bit to, to, to kind of straighten out my back or to feel a little bit better. And you know, there's something amazing about that half inch that airline seats recline that you're just like, whoa, I'm really far back right now. And I recognize that some people get bothered when someone reclines the seat back in front of them. So I'm just a little curious. If you're bothered when a person in front of you reclines their seat on an airplane, would you raise your hand? See, that's, that's news to me. I, I didn't know that that actually bothered people. So I'm sitting in this seat in Hawaii or flying back on the plane and I recline my seat back just a little bit. I have my tablet out. I'm going over the message that I was gonna be preaching in just a few hours. I'm in my happy place. I'm listening to God and I'm, ooh, doo -doo, and I'm typing these notes and I'm feeling great. And after about an hour, an old man behind me grabbed my seat, pulled it back further, and he began yelling at me. And through his choice of vocabulary, he let me know that I was one of the rudest, meanest, most hateful person in the world. He was repulsed that I had reclined my seat. And this guy had his angry eyes on. Have you ever seen Mr. Potato Head when he puts on his angry eyes? I mean, this guy, he was bald. He had on his angry eyes. He was letting me have it. And as he let me have it and the spittle landed on my face, I just kept thinking, man, he has his angry potato head eyes on. <laughs> now, what I wanted to say to him was actually different than what I said to him. What I wanted to say to him was a totally different thing. I won't tell you what I wanted to say to him but I will tell you what I did say. Here's what I said when he finished. I said, I am so sorry. I wish you would have said something earlier. My wife and I will raise our seats and we won't recline back any further. Now I could tell that he was not expecting me to be kind. It caught him off guard. He was still angry. He yelled another 10 seconds or so and it felt like an eternity on the plane because I'm sitting down and he's standing up and he's yelling at me. And then he pointed at the words on my tablet that I was typing and he said this, and you're reading that Christian crap. I'm thinking, well, it's my sermon. It probably is a little crappy. I could probably probably work on it a little bit, but I didn't reply. Christy and I raised our seats up and we kept our backs in that square 90 degree hold for the next four hours. We said nothing to him at all. When the plane landed, it touched down. We got up to leave. I stood up and a very quiet voice, the old man said to me, sir, I'm sorry for all the way I spoke to you. I didn't have to speak that way to you and I'm sorry. I stuck out my hand. I said, don't worry about it. I forgive you. It's not a problem. But what I wanted to say is, <laughs> now I'm not perfect. I, I struggled in that moment with what I really wanted to say against what I needed to say. I've not stopped sinning since I gave my life to Jesus, but I am forgiven. 
My life has been changed. I, I, I do good works now. I tell others about Jesus. I do strive to sin less, but the reality is I still sin. And if as a follower of Jesus, you were being honest, you would acknowledge that you still sin as well, that we all wander from God's path from time to time. Even if we consistently spend time in the morning, pouring out our heart to God, reading his word, we still find that during the day, our hearts wander away from him. There's truth to that old hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. It's because we do. We are sheep who are always wandering and drifting away from God. And if followers of Jesus wander and drift away from God, is it any surprise that the world is in such a mess? If we who have been changed by Jesus wander away from God, is it any wonder that people who are without Jesus wander away? And sometimes the church stops following Jesus and we stop searching for the lost and we focus on what it's like to be a sheep. We just wanna be taken care of. We wanna be pet, we wanna be groomed, we wanna be fed instead of taking the responsibility to be like the shepherd in this passage of scripture. See, the church, what we're called to do is go out in search of the lost. We're called to try to find those people without Jesus and bring them into a right relationship with him. That's why the mission of our church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. It's not to feel good after a message. It's not to, to come in and worship. Our mission is to lead people to Jesus. And sometimes the church just forgets that. Sometimes the church forgets. It's not about our luxury and our comfort. We stop searching for the lost. So I want to encourage you, join the search party and celebrate forgiveness. Join the search party and celebrate forgiveness. Look, look in that passage of scripture. Uh, there's, they're, they're joyfully, the shepherd goes out and when he finds his sheep, he joyfully places it on his shoulders. He rejoices, he calls the neighbors together and he says, hey, rejoice with me because this one that was lost is now found. And what Jesus says, what happens when somebody gives their life to Christ, somebody receives forgiveness of their sins, someone who has wandered gets back on God's path. Jesus says, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Don't you want to be part of a joyful search party? Uh, don't you want to be part of, of looking for people who are lost? That doesn't mean that you go out and condemn the world for their sin. Because as we wander, we sometimes get it wrong. What happens when we start pointing out the sins of other people as we fall back into that category like the religious leaders. See, we don't shame people into becoming a follower of Jesus. On that plane ride home, I could have jumped up and lectured that man on rudeness. Sir, you've been rude to me. You've hurt my feelings. Right? I could have done that. But we have to understand as followers of Jesus, it is not our role to convict the world of sin. It is our role to love people. It's our role and responsibility to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to bring conviction over sin. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's not what Joe Donahue does. That's what the Spirit of God does. Jesus said in John 16, verse seven, and when he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The Holy Spirit's role is to convict the world of sin. That's not your job. Your job is to love people unconditionally. 
Your job is to celebrate when they give their lives to Jesus. Your job is to live out your faith and join the search party. And how do you join the search party? You get involved. Get involved in the life of the church. Get involved in student ministry or children's ministry or first impressions. Get involved in our worship team. Get involved with a group of people that go down to the, the channel and talk to others about Jesus. Get involved with a homeless ministry or food ministry. Get involved with a food pantry. See, it's, it's our role to love our neighbor as ourselves, and we do that as we serve. And as we serve, we're joining in the search party. That means we get to celebrate together when people experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. We build relationships with those who have never received forgiveness for their sins. We laugh with them. We cry with them. We hang out with them so that we can love them to Jesus not convict them of their sin. So uh, let me encourage you, get involved in an area of ministry. Grab that next step card that's located in front of you. Fill it out. Get involved and experience true joy and celebration as you begin to see through your love, God leading people to him. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for this passage of scripture. We, we thank you that for those of us in here who have surrendered our lives to Jesus and got back on the path, thank you. Thank you for searching for us and thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for giving us life and hope and purpose and thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And now God, it's our prayer that we would all join you in the search party that we would all live out our lives of loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and do everything we can to love our neighbor as ourselves and treat others the way we want to be treated. Father, we continue to love you. We continue to thank you. And now, God, we stand to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.